Um, so now um, I guess we can start the next uh, next uh, session, which will be about uh, Anaconda's web UI. Uh, I'm Vladimir Slavik, and this is uh, Martin Kolman, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully we'll uh, talk to you, and then you will talk to us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, so what is the web UI? Uh, I guess you saw some uh, pictures somewhere. Maybe on Foronix or I don't know where. <laughs> this usual places. Um, uh, what is it for us as developers of Anaconda? Well, it's a new UI, so uh, it's a chance to fix the mistakes we made with the previous one. Uh, it's an opportunity to do things uh, better, uh, hopefully with the help of uh, somebody who knows what they are doing. Uh, which might not be always necessarily us, uh, and it's also well uh, for into other technologies than we used so far. Um, what it looks like? Well, uh, it's uh, it's blue, I guess. Is the first thing you can tell. <laughs> Look at. It. So that uh, matches the Fedora uh, Fedora branding quite nicely, I guess. Uh, the one thing that's very different, uh, I guess you know already how Anaconda looks. Uh, what the new UI looks like is that it's a wizard, so it has steps, numbered. So that's the main difference. Um, otherwise, well, there's buttons, there's things to click, so I guess that's the part that's uh, not so different. Um, uh, and, uh, well, at the moment it's very limited, so uh, I can't show exactly uh, more than these two pictures, but it already works. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, I guess you can you can look at this and see that there's uh, a lot of the, like, uh, design language uh, shared with uh, web applications, which, well, given that the new UI is a web UI, so it's technically a web application is... So it's no surprise. Uh, and yeah, um, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, so, how does it work uh, technically? Uh, well, we build heavily on cockpit uh, as a technology, not necessarily as a well, if, as a thing that you would uh, see uh, in the UI itself. Uh, the UI itself is a plugin, cockpit, and uh, so the GTK UI is reduced to just you know a frame with the GTK WebKit browser, which shows uh, this thing. The web page is uh, in Patternfly and React because that's what cockpit does. Uh, and uh, cockpit itself actually bridges the gap between the web page and uh, the DBus uh, API that we have for the actual Anaconda code that does the work of the installing and setting up things. So that means that the backend is the same as uh, we currently have. So it's just the buttons that change. There's no changes in the backend for this. Mostly just you know adding things to export, I don't know, list, list of languages uh, that should be in front of the address and so on. So there's very minimal changes to that. So, um, yes, next nice please. Oh, one more slide. Yes, uh, how far we are with this? So, uh, given that the backend stays, obviously it can actually install and do everything. Uh, but uh, the UI itself is uh, moving towards something that we could show the public and let them try. Uh, we kind of hope that it might be uh, with the next Fedora, mm -hmm. like 37. Uh, we don't want to promise that because it depends on other things, not just us. Mm -hmm. So we're not promising, we're just saying we would like to do that. Uh, mm, well. You saw the two screens, so there wasn't too much to click on, so uh, <laughs> obviously, yes. Uh, what we have so far is the language, which, which is like the first thing you encounter, and then the disks, because 
you don't want to destroy the machine uh, with this. Uh, if you're so adventurous that you actually start it on something. Uh, and these are the most important things. Uh, and the rest is just not there yet because we are still working on everything. Mm. Uh, and uh, the goal is to install live images uh, so that uh, it would be uh, actually a way to install Workstation at first. Mm -hmm. Because Workstation, as you know, has the uh, setup uh, from GNOME where you can actually set up the users and everything. So that uh, lets us skip these things at first. And yeah, eventually it will be able to do everything else uh, that the backend actually enables. And that's it, I think. Yeah, I've just said about like the, the Fedora 77 plant, basically. The idea is to have a public image, but not necessarily have it as part of the official deliverables. So we plan to start releasing images somewhere like on, on some public space. That will, be our, that will be like regularly updated and that people can then use to try out the insta an installation image with the new web UI. But it's not yet about being a part of the boot ISOs and live images that are like part of the official federal deliverables or spins just yet. It's about like making it as, as accessible as possible while not disrupting yet the normal installation hmm, artifacts, let's say. Hmm. Yeah. Essentially it will be a demonstration of the of the web UI, not of mm -hmm. uh, like the whole process of actually installing Fedora with the web UI successfully end to end. Mm -hmm. like, we would like to basically install our F37 release, uh, release time snapshot to the system. Basically it's a tarpeyload deployment at the moment. But uh, yeah, the idea, as, as uh, Vanya mentioned, the backend supports everything. So basically the backend supports, of course, package-based installations. So that's something that will most likely, uh, like, yeah, that, that will be supported eventually as well and other stuff that we support. So, okay, let's see, I think. Yeah, so basically, I, I, I think I can take over. Uh, so thanks a lot, for Vladia, for the introduction. I'm not sure, like, we were not sure, like, if it's necessary or not, because, like, some people definitely heard about the project, hopefully. Like, how many of you didn't hear about, like, the Anaconda Web UI? Here yeah, or didn't, yeah. Didn't hear. Oh. Okay, so that, that's, that's better. So, yeah, it's, we were right to do it, so. <laughs> Thanks to Dan Vladia for the introduction. Uh, and yeah, so about this, this event, so this is using the discussion format and it's basically about that, that we already did quite a bunch, quite a bit of like some presentations. And actually like I, I would say the most interesting part of the last presentation was like the discussion afterwards. So this is like, okay, let's, let's try something more interactive. Uh, and the idea is basically that uh, we have some, a couple of topics. And we would like to ask your questions and see, to get some feedback and ideas. And at the same time have some sort of a structure. So we will basically go over some uh, ideas and questions and topics. And we will see how far we get, like it could be. Yeah, please go ahead. I have a question. So from developer point of view, mm -hmm. why, why do you do this at first place? Like, uh, does it save you work or? Yeah, so basically, uh, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them, like we are trying to fix fix more things at once. And for example, we, we had some not not the best uh, developer experience with GDK, For example, like we hit some some weird issues, and it always looked like that uh, it's pretty hard to get like anything inside or anything changed in the widgets themselves. And so we we looked into how like projects with, that use the button fly toolkit, for example, work with them. And they, it looks like they are much more, they have much more resources to, to respond to projects. And there are like working groups where you can get, there is like, like one working group even just for installers, like there are like OpenShift installers doing similar things that we want to do. So that, that seems like uh, worth the investment to learn a um, new technology. At the same time, it's much easier to address some of the longer standing issues without like changing an existing UI under users, basically. So now we are working with a long-term experienced UX designer, basically, and we are trying to do the stuff correctly. Another thing, like the Pattern Fly Toolkit has design guidelines that all the projects 
the major projects using it are trying to uh, are trying to respect. So people who might be using cockpit are more likely to be able to successfully use the installer because the current installer isn't actually like built like from in, in vacuum. It was basically built at the time when GNOME 3 was the new thing, but like it never really like got upgraded or something like that. So by following like using the pattern fly, it's more likely that we will be able to do to use something that people will be familiar with from other projects like. On RHEL, there is a lot of two things that have a similar web UI. And even on Fedora, like, I think a lot of people are using Cockpit and other tools that are using Patternfly and Cockpit ready technologies. And the last thing is, without going into too much detail, is, is remote access. That has been a pain point for quite a long time. Like, if you wanted to do a graphic installation remotely, the only option was VNC, which is unsecure, inefficient, and uh, pretty hard to actually use for people in, in an environment where they might not be able to install like software free like some corporate environments. In comparison, if you do a web UI, like everyone has a web browser, you can use SSL to have it reasonably secure and it's much more lightweight because you are not doing uh, on, on <coughs> machine rendering. Mm -hmm. so, okay, Any, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, for the VNC. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, no project uh, recently changed the um, like default protocol for remote access mm -hmm. to RDP. Yeah. If you have, I know that we web UI is at the end much easier to use that setting up things with RDP. Mm -hmm. But uh, have you considered that as an option? Yeah, I've, I've tried to use the RDP on on Fedora 36 and have not been able to make it work. But I know I have noticed the switch, but it doesn't really help us too much. I'm not sure like. I know the, the limitations of VNC, but the biggest problem with VNC is that basically we are rendering like locally, we are shipping render, locally rendered data over network. Like with VNC, for example, like if you wanted to use it on some uh, limited hardware like uh, Raspberry Pis and stuff like that, you need a bigger image, you need more RAM, you need more CPU to just render something on a ARM SBC and then ship it over network. In comparison, we are not yet doing that, but it would open the possibility to have a really small image that just basically has a web server running on it. That opens the web sockets to your browser and then you can do a really nice graphical installation on a SBC with really slow everything. And it should be much more usable. For example, even with the RDP, it might be more fancy and more like modern, but still you are doing local rendering, so you need to have like hundreds of megabytes of graphical dependencies and then also render it all and so yeah but th th that's a good point we might want to look into that but it looks like this kind of like scraps the whole thing and do it does it better hopefully yeah please go ahead just one comment i remember when we discussed this 10 years ago maybe yeah, it's, your, uh, it's your idea actually i think yeah but uh I w one of the motivations back then was it's almost impossible to test gtk mm, yeah that, that's right that, that's a good one point. of the issues and Second, things like accessibility, custom CSS, and like zooming in, zooming out, things like this. You already have that for free in the browser. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, really good with point. With a TPK application, you are pretty much screwed because... And I, I'm kind of sad about it, basically. Like, it's not that you couldn't do it in GTK, like all you do there. It's yeah. just that like you, you really see like all the money that has been invested by, by all the companies that are involved in web technologies these days in action in the web technologies. Like it's not always going into the good things. Like sometimes you see like a lot of complexity that might not be necessary strictly. And I'm really glad that we are like in, at like the sixth generation of these JavaScript frameworks because I don't really want to th even think about using something <coughs> free like some jQuery whatever. It's 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 usable, let's say, and it's as as you mentioned, like that's that's, that's, that's small things, but like uh, now we can show logs. Like if we wanted to implement a log viewer in GTK, yeah, it would it would be possible, but it would be much harder than like using Patternfly log viewer, and then like cockpit file access plugins, like five lines of code. Like it wouldn't be five lines of code in GTK, I'm afraid. And yeah changing the text size like you can copy paste stuff from the web UI because if you remotely connect to it that's already like 
pretty nice usability feature, I would say. Like, you don't know what something is, then you can like copy paste it into Google or something. It's it's smaller things, but it's a lot of smaller things actually. And about the testing, that it might be interesting for someone. Uh, Cockpit pro project is not just this nice web console. They have a lot of tooling, and some of the tooling we are using for testing. And they have a really nice <coughs> toolkit that can do both uh, like um, event-based and uh, pixel-based testing of of web UI. So that's that's what we are using to like click the click on stuff in the web UI quite nicely. It's it, you can write this in Python these tests, and they will like uh, interact with the UI in quite a nice way and there's also a way how to do like pixel perfect testing which is really useful because you have a whole bunch of uh, javascript dependencies that have updates every five milliseconds and it, unless you want to manually test all of these a really good smoke test is to do these pixel tests so if you get a new react or something on pattern fly you can check if it changed the layout of the resulting web ui it's a good really good smoke test that it's not totally broken with the update. Yeah. Uh, regarding user experience, uh, are you collecting some approaches from different installers, from different distros? Are you somehow inspiring by them, combining uh, good things of them, for example? Yeah, we are, we are definitely looking uh, for that. and. Uh, not not yet in like really just like pick and place like ideas but <clears throat> one thing we are looking into is also uh there's let's say the viewport like uh with the with the web ui we need to think more about like browser window for example because that could be really dynamic again pattern fly is it's called it is it, they say it's uh, uh reactive i think or something like or uh Responsive. responsive. So basically, it, it can scale the UI elements as necessary in most cases. So it can run on. It, it helps with like portrait windows or with mobile devices, but it also kind of handles most of the cases where people like change the viewport all the time. But at the same time, uh, the problem is like uh, we need to support remote access, but we also need to support local access. And you might have noticed uh, the trend to have ma ma wider and wider scale, wider screen monitors. So one, th one thing that we are uh, at the moment looking how other installers handle is, is this, basically. If you have this like 21 to 10 monitor, how do the other installers do it? Like what we are looking into that we might want to locally do is a constrained viewport for the installer. So basically we keep some same aspect ratio. And basically if you have like this big monitor, you would have something that's, that's still usable and not like you have the wizard. I'll step change it there and then like the done button somewhere <laughs> and then like either lots of white space or you know, so basically this is something that we are already actively looking into other other installers yeah please go ahead well uh, I'm just uh, uh, remembering the first or second slide uh, where you have uh, the screen and you have the button and the, at the down, uh, at the down right? mm -hmm forward or next or back yep well i'm i have a interest well, is there any convention because uh in the linux system usually each application has a different order i mean yes no buttons mm -hmm. you know it's on the one side on the right, on left side on another side on the opposite side in other distribution like windows it's more convenient to have it in one order I mean, is there any recommendation how to design such a buttons in which order? I think we are using the defaults from Buttonfly for this. I I, mm -hmm. I, I I think Butterfly has this and we are just respecting that. So I was literally just looking at the Patternfly design guidelines for the wizard and have it? they explicitly spell out the order the buttons should go in. Perfect. Yeah. That's also why we have a designer on the team, so yeah. I'm sorry, I can't really answer that. <laughs> yep, go ahead. I know that uh, current Anaconda installer has uh, a rapid degree for yeah. partitioning disks, mm -hmm. which I found very convenient, mm -hmm. apart from the manual partitioning. And I don't know if that application is just that there is some library and 
the GDK fountain on top of it, but will the web installer have something like that using that library or how will you exactly do the even at more advanced partitioning? Yeah, so basically uh, just how it, how it actually works right, right at the moment, like uh, the the GUI, this is basically like this is a uh, mm, uh, normal Anaconda uses the Blivet storage library for most of, for storage modeling basically because what Anaconda does and it's kind of different than more many other storage management tools uh, we basically like scan the storage uh, using the Blivet storage library and then we apply the actions either from like uh, kickstart for automated installations or what the, what the user will like input what they want to do with the system into the model and then we have a reasonable chance that this is a storage layer that can be created. And then only after like we are sure that mostly sure that it will it will work, we will kind of commit the model to the to the system. And the Blivet GUI is a graphical user interface for this library that can be also used as a standalone application on Fedora. And this is uh, in the current Anaconda. This is a GTK Python GTK application, and this is basically embedded as part of the current Python GTK interface. So basically, as this doesn't currently have any like web interface for itself, uh, it's uh, not something that we can like one-to-one -one use in the web UI. But basically, what we are looking into at the moment is that we will mo definitely continue using the Blivet storage library that is uh, the, the backend for not only Anaconda but also for the Blivet GUI. So the power of these technologies will still be available there. But we are still looking into the details, like how it will look like. Like one idea we have at the moment, and we still are <coughs> investigating. It's we are, it's not decided like it will go like this. Is to uh, use Blivet for the use the Blivet for let's say like guided or profile based partitioning. We would like to make it much easier for people who want to do like the often used uh, cases, like yeah, wipe all the data and reinstall. Yeah, that, that's easy. Or I have like this Fedora install or whatever Debian possibly install something, and I want to reuse my home folder, stuff like that. Or even yeah, resize my Windows installation and put Fedora next to it, stuff like that. Is where the Blivet storage modeling is is ideal. The same stuff is for Kickstart based installations. That's also based on Blivet, and already it's really useful that you can basically say to people like yeah, this Kickstart won't work before you wipe their data. So no change there. But what we are looking into, that might be an interesting option if it works out, which is not yet clear, is basically we are looking into possibly using some existing cockpit plugins in the installer. And one of them that we are looking into is the cockpit storage plugin. At the moment it's pretty simple, but we are thinking that possibly we could do the manual partitioning using the cockpit storage plugin. It would be a departure from what we have now, because it won't, that won't be using Blivet, that would be using like direct direct changes to the target system. But on the other hand, like we are thinking like we will need a pretty complex interface for web interface for storage manipulation. Cockpit already has quite a complex, not yet that supporting all we need interface for storage manipulation. Maybe we can like cooperate on development on this and have the manual complex do-it-yourself partitioning the same as in cockpit, maybe extend it so cockpit users will have more more support for more technologies. At the same time, we won't be re-implementing yet another manual partitioning interface. Like we would implement the installation-specific profile-based Blivet using partitioning and use the cockpit plugin. Maybe we will see. That's that's an, an idea, and we are currently looking in if it will work. So that was comprehensive. I'm sorry for that. Too much information. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question. You uh, said that it's going to be something like a wizard. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I would like to ask just, uh, will it be possible to jump back uh, in that wizard? And uh, will it remember all the changes I have made before yeah. I went back? Yeah, I, I think the idea is that basically uh, you first need to visit a screen, but then you can use the step switcher on the left to get back to any screen. Like this is the idea. We are already aware of some issues with like optional optional steps and stuff like that. But that's the general idea. 
Like mm -hmm. you, you first need to go to this screen, but you should be able to get back. And that's kind of also a specific thing for the web UI. Like the current GTK interface was very, very stateful. Like once a screen is loaded, it's always there. It has some data. We need to make sure it actually ends up in the backend. In this case, we need to handle stuff like people reconnecting to the web interface remotely and refreshing the site to start the, the page. So yeah, we really need work to work with the backend data anyway. So that should not be a problem, hopefully. And uh, then I have another question. Uh, it uh, happened to us uh, when we tried to uh, squeeze the Windows partition a bit, especially with Windows 11, that uh, we somehow triggered the BitLocker and then it wasn't very good for the Windows user. Will you address that somehow, or? That's kind of a thing for the for the like underlying technology. Like as I've mentioned with the profiles, we would like to make more st the stuff that the computer can do automatically. We would like to make it accessible, so people. This is like something where we can ask questions and people will say like, do it or something like that. But it's this is really a techno like low uh, low uh, level technology question. Like we would have had the same issue with the GTK interface. Basically, and um, please go ahead. You had a question yeah, for waiting. Uh, I had, but I see that it's uh, one minute past four. Do we still have time? We have uh, one hour slot, so. Ah, okay, cool. So, I actually noticed that you've mentioned that you have installer, um, sorry, the live CD installation supported, right? Does it mean that you can, you know, you can run it on the live CD and then deploy that image, or you know, you just boot the installer, which dumps some sort of pre-configured or live image? So what we have now and what's, what we will release like in the F37 time frame is uh, it's effectively a boot ISO with like the similar level of functionality as the as the current Fedora workstation. Okay, so it's live CD based. It's, uh, we, we call it like a minimal viable product okay. thing because basically that's the idea is that the next step is most likely to be an actual live CD that uses, instead of the GTK interface, mm -hmm. uses this interface to install. Because like it's not really that different. Like What we have now is a tarball that we will unpack to the system. In the live CD, the change is basically that instead you mount the it only a base layer and then dump it into the system. Yeah. So. And let me tell you why I was asking, because I see mm -hmm. that it's more and more popular to just dump some pre-configured image on the drive and use ignition combustion, something that will configure it on the first boot. And we are trying something similar with desktop, now on Leap, for example, no, this mm -hmm. is a Leap. And you guys have something like that for pre-configured images as well. Like, you know, where it's not, it's not, it's not exactly live CD, but it's almost like dumping a live CD. Like, it, it depends like how, what additional steps you need to no, like, this will, this will do the like, storage. And then the the last last for like, dump files on it. Yeah, exactly. The only reason is, the only purpose is just to dump the image. Like, do not even ask user any questions, just dump it. You know, we, we have something like that, like very minimal wizard. And I feel like this this can be like more 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 and more trendy, even on desktop, like some, you know, for, for OEMs and stuff like that. Yeah, like this is kind of like an artifact of like us wanting to have end to end installations. It's, as easy and as simple as possible before like it's already was not easy to like bootstrap it all mm -hmm. we, that, that was really nice cooperation with the cockpit team we actually had a person from cockpit for a couple of months working mm -hmm. working with us full time to get it all bootstrapped okay so that was uh, that really helped us to get going mm -hmm. and it really helped that also that we decided to start with a limited amount of features okay. at the same time Yeah, please go ahead. Speaking about cockpit, and you mentioned it already, are mm -hmm. are there any plans to reuse the screens that they already have to somehow maybe cut them off from the cockpit backend and hook them up to the Anaconda backend instead? So basically that's the that's the thing about the manual partitioning. So the idea that that's one of the candidates. Like uh, we actually had a, we, we talked with the cockpit team and mentioned like yeah it's like we are already a plugin and this would be another plugin is will, will it work and the reply was yes it will mm -hmm. and if there are like three three ways how you can do it like you could like switch to another cockpit or something that doesn't fit that much or you could use it basically as a black box so like you, you just take the whole plugin and put it 
as a step into the interface that would work. And also that's more involved for actually the, the, the structure of the plugin itself. You can basically like, do these like parts of it. You can kind of uh, kind of like see in the cockpit screens that they, it's kind of some some like some boxes or something like that. I, I think it, you could you could do it at this level. You could like take these take these like bits of it if it's correctly built, and then you could embed that in your web application in random places basically. So some sort of this we are look, we are really looking into it in. Definitely the storage and possibly even like networking because already like we are, we are looking we are building pattern fly interface for a cockpit plugin essentially so it would really make sense as you mentioned to kind of share the code and uh, if if this if we can work this out if even if we like um, had to address their concerns and they they address ours it still makes sense to just do one thing and use it both in Anaconda and in the cockpit interface. Yeah, because they already have many things, right? Like they have user creation, root password. You can start and stop services. You mm -hmm. can configure firewall, whatever. So it would be best that if people could just use the same screens in the installer that they have in cockpit, but instead of configuring the the runtime of the installer, they would configure the install system, mm -hmm. but they would use the same screens. Yeah, it might not work in all cases. Like in many yeah. cases, it's it's talking to live system debug APIs, and it would require a big changes. Or and the screen is possibly like uh, there are some considerations why you would want to do it differently in the installer. But especially with with all, some screens already, it it's ma it's, it makes sense. Like when you are already like manipulating storage, you can just like uh, tell it where you want to manipulate the storage. Instead, with the users, for example, that could be more involved, like uh, that you don't have, just don't have the system, or you don't have the system yet. So it might not be that easy to kind of like emulate it or something. But in other cases, it's it's totally fine, totally possible on a technical level, and we hope it it will work out. But you could provide the same Dbus API, right? Like, like in some cases, I think we still need to to get the data effectively, like before we start the installation. I'm not sure about the user. I, I kind of think that we might need to have the, the data before we actually like, create the system. So if it expects to be talking to whatever user creation daemon over the bus, it could be problematic. Well, if you provide the same dbus API, then you can instead I'm not sure of creating how you user... can like fake it like this. But... Yeah. yeah, but then you will model the whole, whole thing, and prepare it before it will be created. Yeah, that's a, that's a it's good quite thing. complex, I think. Might be more work than implementing the new UI <laughs> plugin. Yeah, one thing is that, for example, for the users, uh, we still haven't like got any like real lot of requirements to like support all the complexities of user creation on a, a system where you already have other users and all the specifics. So we are thinking that some like simpler user interface to just create like one user or like the things that are really necessary to be done at installation time, might be better than to like support. Maybe it could be too complex or something like that. Hmm. We had also some questions for you, so. Uh... Yeah, so that, that's another thing. Like we actually like, maybe people won't ask, so we like create like a whole bunch of uh, stuff. But I, I think we can like skip some of those or maybe, maybe like, let, let's, let's see like, so this is more more abstract, but like, but let's get some answers. So, what I would like to some of you to say, like, how would you like to imagine an the ideal installer? Please go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking about, uh, for example, if I need it for a specific case. For example, let's say imaginal case, a company wants to have their own images, mm -hmm. and for example, they have some internal stuff or setting up some specific stuff and add a plugin to the install mm -hmm. itself and make a new step in the wizard where you could add some stuff. Yeah. But to that, yeah, I, I think that's, that, that goes, that, that's a good <coughs> answer for this. And I would say that this is, this is planned. Basically already in the Anaconda interface you can add uh, plugins. It either like just like something that's part of an automated installation or even the text interface. Anaconda has a text interface that's not, not influenced by the web UI project at all, that will stay stay there. And you can add a GTK uh, Anaconda interface add-ons already. 
And we definitely want to keep this in the web UI as well. So basically it will be a cockpit plugin basically as well. So that could actually make it more accessible to people because I think there are definitely much more, uh, much, much more projects creating uh, cockpit plugins than there are Anaconda add-ons. It's kind of like, it's totally different for the Anaconda at the moment. It could be much more similar to just another cockpit plugin that there are quite many, but it could help. Okay, so okay. thanks for the answer. That's that's good, good I, good mm -hmm. idea. I think. Any 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 other like, what do, what do you do if you wanted to create an install? But you have more questions, so I think yeah. Please go ahead. On the same topic, I feel in many cases it's about having a good balance in between steps before and after the installation. For desktop, mm -hmm. you probably want to do more after. For server, probably more before. So having mm -hmm. you know, realizing the balance and tweaking for the use case would be really good. Yeah. My, 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 my comment for that is we will definitely need to handle that and we kind of handle it right now. You also Be use no initial setup, right, for the yeah. user part? Yeah. Basically on the Fedora workstation there is like two screens yes. and the rest is via GNOME initial setup. On the other hand, on RHEL there is like 15 screens and no GNOME initial setup in many cases. But this is expected, right? Yeah. But already this is something we can handle better. Like that, that's one of the ideas, like with the wizard stuff. We can much easier, much more easily pack a lot of screens there. And at the same time, if you don't have like 15 screens, it doesn't look that st as stupid as it does now when you have like just like these two small status icons for two screens on a huge screen. We yeah, even mentioned something that we do that may be interesting for you. So after the GNOME initial setup, we even have like, I think it's called Mod First Boot, which installs like non RPM content after the user logged in, mm -hmm. like flat packs from FlatHub and so on. So yeah. I kind of find it really cool. Mm -hmm. I have one oh. idea, but maybe this sure. is already known. Uh, have you perhaps considered that uh, people could record the installation process and uh, have a kickstart file created so that they could reuse that same installation process on other machines? So that, that's already there from like an L6 or something. Or from like, but not on Fedora. So basically, any Anaconda an installation creates a kickstart file describing the installation, and it's stored in in, uh, in uh, the slash root folder. The, the only problem is that it's it's not like something that's let's say you are integrated at all, and uh, it's most it, in many cases it's not like hundred percent the same. Like you usually should like take the the file as a template. Like if you wanted to do it on a different hardware, like the partitions might not fit and stuff like that. Mm. It's good to like read it at least once before you try to install the machine again from it. But it captures all the <laughs> configuration Okay, there. but if I don't know about this... Then you, you don't know you need it, so... <laughs> 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 but yeah, that, that, uh, yeah, with the web UI, what we could do and what we thought about as an idea, but we haven't tried to like implement it. You can much more easily like paste stuff into the remote interface, especially. So we are we are, we are thinking that maybe you could like export this file much more easily than with the current interface. Possibly you could have some sort of access to it, so you can like copy paste it out instead of fishing for files on the system. Yes, maybe. possibly even the other way around. Like yeah, open a window, put the Kickstart content in it. That could work. So so when is the uh... Start file actually generated. Could it be possible for the, the, to what? show it in the in the UI for demo? <coughs> so I, I think it would be doable. At the moment, it's written written out at the very very end of the oh. installation. But I think like by the uh, by the time you you are able to press the begin installation button, it needs to be basically stable. Uh -huh. I, I, I think it doesn't change after that. So technically, I think we should be able to dump it at at any moment. And if I had the Kickstart file ready, and I would load it into the Anaconda, would that affect the wizard so that I could make changes in the wizard? Actually, I'm not sure we want to like really, really commit to that because there is a lot of data sources that can influence like the like the state of the backend. So at the moment, I'm not really sure we want to really like. Totally 100% commit to it as a stable supported functionality because you already have like the data on the system, you have defaults, you have the, the kickstart file. So once you already did it once, then kind of reloading it 
It's not that simple. I don't think reloading it, but I, I thought like uh, I have a friend who is a total newbie, so I performed the installation for me once, and then I just distribute the kickstart and uh, yeah, that's that's basically automated installation. Th they automated could just uh, make some changes in the in the Anaconda before they hit uh, the installation, which perhaps would probably show that there is a conflict in storage, for example, or something like that. Like at the moment, like what you are basically describing is like partial kickstart installation where you have a kickstart that's not complete because uh, the logic currently works in a way that when the kickstart is complete, the installation is started. So you need to have incomplete kickstart so it doesn't start the installation and you can pre-configure the interface. And yeah, we are, uh, we are, it has a lot of issues at the moment. So we are looking into ways how to possibly do it in a, another way or do it better or something like that. And I think Vladimir maybe wants to mention something. Yeah, there's, uh, there's an issue and uh, that issue is that uh, with the backend you can, uh, like with the kickstart, easily uh, you know, automate the creation of the kickstart and write kickstarts that have a lot of information in them or, or scripts possibly. Even and you can't replicate that exactly with the user interface. You, you won't exactly have a person typing in a Python script to run after the installation is complete. Uh, so there's a, what's it called disparity between these uh, these two things. What the UI offers and what the backend offers technically. And so uh, it's very easy to get into a situation where the kickstart will, for example, describe 15 users to create, but the UI supports just one. So, yeah, that's... Okay, so, like, we have lots of stuff that is supported only in Kickstart and that's kind of on purpose. Like, it's not realistic to support everything in the interface, unfortunately. So, I think there will always be some mismatch between what you can do in the Kickstart. On the other hand, I, I understand, like, mm, and that's something to, to discuss, I think. Like, definitely, if you want to talk about that, we can, we can meet about that. Or we have, like, some communication channels. We have, like, discussions on, on our GitHub project. We have a mailing list. I, I have it in the slides, like, later on. So, I, I, well, let's go to the next one. Let's see what we have here. Um, I'm not sure this is a good question right now, because, like... Mm, um, I'm not sure what the third one is, actually. Uh, automated. <laughs> yes, that, that, that actually reminds, uh, reminds me of how we get the user requests and how we need to interpret them, yes. That's... Yeah, so basically, how many of you have done an automated installation? That's actually, I think, a good question. Like the Anaconda, right? Yes. Do you know that it's possible? Yes. You have done it? And you too. And that's all, really. Like, do you know what Kickstart is? And have you have you used it for an automated installation? Yeah, once or twice, maybe. I, I think mm. we need to make it more more accessible. So basically, um, it's about making the installation fully automatic. You have a file that describes what you want the system to look like, and then you configure Anaconda to boot and to load this file, most likely from a HTTP server, or even you can include it on an image, and then everything happens automatically, on, and you reboot into the install system. I think the biggest user of Kickstarter is uh, Beaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also Satellite is using it for, provision, for machine provisioning, and yeah, it's, it's like, it, it's the, the, the few people who install the most machines, most likely, they are using Kickstarter. I'm thinking uh, with the web interface, if, if you are actually using the browser as, as the UI, mm -hmm. or doing it remotely, you could, in theory, uh, highlight this option more, and you maybe ask for upload of the Kickstarter file mm -hmm. through the UI, right? That would, wouldn't be possible in the GTK, because you, you, you would have VNC that, that wouldn't really work, right? Okay. VNC has some support for copy paste, but it's not very dependable, I would say. Uh -huh. In the web UI, really, that's, that's a really huge thing, I, I think, <coughs> that you can work with text. You can copy paste, and it should work always. As yeah, long as you can connect to the machine, it's just a web application, so it's all text. And you can, like, if you have any errors or like some weird behavior, you just copy paste the stuff out of the installer. And as you mentioned, 
that would be that, that's something we, we thought about like that would be really nice because like one of the first steps could be something like that it yeah. could be like a input kickstart you paste it in and but yeah we still have the issues that vladimir mentioned so mm -hmm. if we can fix those or some somehow solve it it would be nice please, please go ahead what's the plan for authentication <coughs> And that's actually not easy at all. Definitely. Like, <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah, encryption is nice. Like, we can definitely do it. Like, but like, how do you tell that you are talking to the installer? Because like, yeah, yeah you have SSL certificates, but that, that's for a, a domain. So like, if this is, you have the same problem that you have with, with household routers. Like each of them is on some random IP address or some like uh, automated Avahi whatever. Uh, DNS, MDNS interface, and like, how, how do you know that you are talking to the router and not to a hijacker on your network somehow? So that, that's problematic. So like, we can definitely encrypt, but how do we keep the chain of trust somehow? That that will not be easy. Another thing is like how you how you authenticate. Like even if you somehow like accept a self-signed certificate or something, or even just do it over HTTP because whatever. Then that kind of drops one of the benefits of the remote access to the API, unfortunately. Another thing is like how do you handle passwords, let's say. So one, one option is basically that you need to have physical access to the machine. Then we can show you like fingerprint of the certificate and you, the auto-generated password. That, that, that's most likely one of the options. Another one is that you just basically like put the password in somehow. It could have like kickstart or even boot option. Like it still means you need to have physical access to the machine, or you need to pre-configure the machine to boot into the image. And one other another thing is that uh, I'm not sure have any of you heard about the image builder project, perhaps? Yeah, composer. Right? Composer image builder. Yeah, it's, it's basically a depend. I think a composer is maybe upstream project, or basically image builder is deployment, something like that. It's a project that aims to make it much easy, much more easy for people to build images, both images that you would deploy on a cloud and installation images. So one option could be that you basically like create your own installation image and burn in the, your certificates and whatever authentication tokens into the image and then just boot it. So you won't have to fudge with like any boot menus or whatever. And the chain of trust is is handled by you because you burn in the trusted certificates, like keys and stuff, into the image. And you could even do this, make the image connect to your infrastructure somehow. Like it could connect to some like jump host and basically like tell you, hey, I'm, I'm, installation has started. I'm on this IP address and yeah, you, because I, you input info certificates into this image, you will know like, yeah, this is really my image talking to me. Please go ahead. Yeah, but if you create your own image, isn't it just easier to just deploy it rather than go through configuration steps if you already invest into, you know, the creation part? Like if you if you can make it uh, either generic enough or your hardware is is uh, the same, then you can pre-configure it to do the installation for you automatically as well. One thing that uh, I think uh, Franta from Fedora QA suggested is basically if something goes wrong, then you can activate this. Oh, okay. If something goes wrong, then you could, you might be able to uh, much more easily investigate what went wrong. Because uh, there is even a, a terminal, em terminal emulator, web-based terminal emulator uh, component for cockpit. There are log viewers, so it might be much, more, much, much easier to debug uh, automated installation issues yeah. if you can easily connect via web interface to the stack machine then to try to somehow find out what went wrong. But yeah, they definitely like, on the other hand, still with the image builder, I can imagine the cases where you are like a campus admin and you have people install like start students installing their, their laptops. So you kind of like pre-configure it so they can easily, or you can easily help them, for example, when the installation gets stuck or something, yeah. there are options. But like definitely, hopefully it will be better than VNC and like the lack of any authentication options at all. Even though like RDP maybe maybe could be better. But I, I think like one one big benefit is one thing one one big benefit is that you just you don't need the software. Like even with the RDP, you need to have an RDP client installed. Like 
you could do the installation from your mobile phone. Like usually, you would have to install an ADP client on your mobile phone, and I'm not sure how well it will work on the screen. Okay, what else do we have there? Uh, I, I think we kind of covered this. Like that's that's definitely something that uh, we will have to handle somehow, both in amount of screens mm. and also uh, as you can as you can think about, like yeah, inputting Kickstart into boxes is. Perfect, but like apparently like half of the people there haven't used Kickstart to do an automated installation. So if we put Kickstart there, like we don't want to confuse people who just want to install their first Linux laptop on the university or something. On the other hand, there are good reasons why you want to do like OpenSCAP profiles and configure uh, S390 storage in the interface. Like so, this is uh, something we are looking into, definitely. And I think we we. I'm not sure like what how how to handle this. I've seen a lot of lot of solutions like basic advanced mode, but I'm not sure. That, that's definitely a challenge. Mm. So okay, this is kind of an interactive thing, and we are over time. But there is a coffee break, so like if people don't want to get a coffee in the next five minutes, we can do this one. <laughs> <laughs> so. Mm, we haven't shown you like one of the screens actually, and this is a screen that is the final screen before we start the installation. That, that's that's new because the spoke, the, the hub, with these like miniatures showing you the, the available screens in the current UI. That was the last screen and the first screen as well. Now we have a screen that recapitalizes what what you can do with the install. So my question is, what would you expect to see on this screen? How how should it look like? Please go ahead. My if I take uh, experience from other installers like mm -hmm. uh, Yast, they pretty much show just some details about it. Yeah, they even mm -hmm. provide advanced features like clicking on it and change it from it again, mm -hmm. as far as I know, and changing some details. But I think one of the most important things would be disk partitioning, because mm -hmm. that's thing when, if you do mistake, you are going to regret yep. it mostly. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe highlighted maybe some images about the mm -hmm. disk layout, which will be there because the graphical representation of that basically somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they put so much information on the? Is it, is it somehow like expandable or? Yes, doesn't scroll. do it. Mm -hmm. But I think Calamaris does uh, that. There's a small like bar where you have the disk mm -hmm. and when one partition and what will happen. Yeah. yeah, I would highlight that that you mentioned that it, they they make it possible to like go back to change it. That's something that we also have been thinking about because, like, if you have many steps, they, they, they already do enable you to go to back to, let's say, arbitrary previous step. But this is easier. Like, with which screen does this whatever scap thing? I want to turn it off and never see it again. Or what? Or on the other hand, I've noticed I have no scap profile. Like, I will like. Um, yeah, my company will end if I install this machine without a SCAP profile. So I can go easily to the SCAP screen when clicking on this. So yeah, any other suggestions? But if, ahead? if it's a wizard, won't the screens that go after one screen be dependent on the previous screens? Mm. That's one of the problems we are looking into. Like, uh, yeah, if you, if, you, if you have like, let's say you have the package installation stuff, so yeah, source and then the f yeah, that, that's the that's something we are looking into at the moment that we will have to be creative about it. At the moment we don't have that, so it works, but we will have to handle it somehow. Go ahead. If you would go with the summary as the last screen, then technically it could be also your first screen if you would start with some defaults. I know that user will not be created or hmm. will not choose the name, but with first would like domination stuff, technically it could be the same as the first. So basically like that is actually a good point. Basically, that's about defaults. Like, yes, yes. This, the, the, what we do is simple, but it actually does a lot of stuff using defaults, and then those are not visible at the moment. We kind of because so basically, this is how it looks like at the moment. It is kind of it doesn't have all the things. It has storage, but it's a really simple storage. It doesn't show you the layout, for example. But yeah, that's definitely something that will have to be extended. It's not yet possible to click on stuff to, to get back to the screens, but we are considering that. And it does scroll. It doesn't, it's not that visible now, but uh, it does scroll. Um, 
So yeah, this is what we have now. But yeah, I agree about the even the visualizations. That's 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 a good point, I think. So, but somehow we might need to have like collapsible sections. But that's the thing, like, you don't see, like, a uh, network uh, NTP or something configuration there, even though we definitely like, use some default value to, to set it up. You don't see bootloader. Like, it, it boots, so it does bootloader configuration. So that, that's, another, that's another thing. Like, if we put there uh, some value, we need to make sure that people know that this is, like, if there is no screen to configure it, that's a problem. So it's it's a question like if we should put there the default values un, until we we don't we have the screens to actually configure them. So that's another problem we are looking into right now. And let's go. Uh, okay, so this is another like the second interactive t stuff, and then I would say like uh, we are over with the mandatory stuff for this talk. So okay, this is the this is the let's say last screen of the install. And basically, we, have, we are looking into some options how to make it look. And basically, the previous one that was the that was the review screen, then you click the begin installation, tells you it will destroy all your data, and you need to agree. And then you get into the the installation progress. After this, you can go back actually. Like after when we start to destroy your system, then it's no way. It's no reason to go back. And we are looking how to make this like uh, make this uh, look nice with the limitations that we actually don't know for many of these steps how long they will take. Like uh, when Dracut starts generating the unit RAM disk, when some of the payloads are installing, we don't have any progress reporting, unfortunately. Also, some of the stuff can depend on external factors like networking. So sometimes it can take five seconds, sometimes five minutes. Mm. And sometimes it can get regularly stuck. I would like to make it easy for people to actually like notice that as well and report the issue, for example. Hmm. So basically, we have like three three variants. Please go ahead. Yeah, with the installation progress. Well, uh, do plan to add uh, because during the RPM installation, mm -hmm. the additional information. First of all, yeah, we have install. information for RPM. That's fine. Like, but we don't have, for example, like the interim disk generation yeah. takes random time. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm not talking about the progress, but uh, to provide the additional information, what's going on. Because uh, sometimes uh, you get some messages from uh, mm -hmm. during, during scriptlets and so on. Yep. Maybe they can be quite important. So unfortunately, I, I don't have this on, on a screenshot, but I think I can, I can, I can show it like in a minute, actually in the basically a demo of the, of the, of the interface. But, uh, would we find out that there is a really nice uh, log viewer component in, in pattern flight that can show you logs, but also arbitrary like structured information. So we, we are thinking about using that to provide more information for the like, stuff like package installation, for example. It looks like a, an ideal candidate. Yeah, uh, I ask because I compare uh, package kit uh, offline installation with the system upgrade from the DNF. Mm -hmm. And from the package kit, you got only progress. Mm -hmm. From the DNF, uh, if you want, you see uh, well what's going on, and also you can you can see the well output uh, from the from the RPM if if you like. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what is better for the users? For debugging, it's better to have like this structured data. Like for one, for sure. But like if if it ends up in, <coughs> for example, maybe it's enough to make it easy to access the journal and to get the data from there. Maybe. Yeah. It's again like basic, advanced. Like, mm -hmm. but yeah. what is confusing for some users? What is uh, is like necessary for others? But I see an reason I there. Mind that it's practical to display that last thing that was happening because the user can only read logs if the screen is responsive, right? What if the machine is stuck and then you <laughs> see what was the last thing that actually was happening? Mm -hmm. I mean, like if the machine totally like Kernel goes bad, <laughs> UI freezes something under, underneath is frozen. You know, then you are basically stuck with what you see here, which is not much, right? And actually, that's the nice Unless thing about the logs. If, 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 the, if this is running, like it depends, like this. The web UI, we are running it locally in the WebKit. Right. WebKit view, like GTK application that is showing WebKit view, view window full screen or, or remotely. Remotely, you will have at least this and you can like highlight exactly. stuff from it. Maybe you could even have like some local cache of the messages or something. You can, but uh, indeed, if the machine dies, then yeah. Now, uh, 
It's, it's a very important and interesting question. Well, maybe not question, but a, a problem. What if the installed machine gets stuck, but what if my machine gets stuck? If I use, uh, you know, like a remote installation and mm -hmm. my machine gets stuck, so nothing happens to the installation basically, right? Yeah, you should be able to reconnect from another machine. But how do I know which one is? Well, I know that my is stuck, but uh, I think it's important uh, that the user still sees something because it confirms that the installation is not stuck. You mean on the local machine? Uh, when I perform like if your the machine dies, then yeah. But when I uh, perform the installation, either locally or remotely, mm -hmm. so I need to see that there is something happening on the screen because. Uh, Sometimes it stops responding, nothing is happening, and how do I know, is it stuck or is it not stuck? Shall I still wait or shall this is, I this not is, wait? This is a problem, and like one, one, one thing like showing you that like if your kernel is still alive locally is basically the spinner. That's actually a really, really nice thing, like this is not a GTK spinner, so it doesn't consume 100% of your CPU, <laughs> it consumes less. Like but it, this, this tells you that your browser or your WebKit view is, is alive enough to animate a spinner. So that's, that's one thing. But the other one is basically, yeah, when we have it, we will provide the, the more granular data. So you, have, you know that something is happening. And also we want to provide like some, like some sort of log access or stuff like that. Because like if, you look, if, if you are an advanced user and you think it's stuck, you might be able to find something out from the logs. Mm -hmm. I'll show you the log viewer in a, in a minute. But basically, just wanted to ask, like, very, very quickly, we have like three, or three, three versions of this. So we have this one, one that is more colorful. It basically shows the progress more with colors. And then one that's totally, totally simple. So I will just go very quickly about them. So this is the more complex one. That is the complex but colorful. And that is the one really, really simple, simple version. And I would just want to ask you, like, raise your hands, let's say, which one do you like the best? So, who likes the more complex but not that colorful one? It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Okay, it's nine for A. Who wants? Who likes the colors? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like. 11 or something. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's slightly more. And who likes to have the least amount of information? Okay, so that's just one. <laughs> who wants to have it more com it's surprising. You have like really advanced users there and they want more information. That's interesting. <laughs> so basically actually this is the this is what we have now and we are going most likely to use something like this, like one of those those two. So this is actually what we have and People mention they don't have enough information on the screen. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's done. Mm, I think we, we, we discussed most of, it, most of it. So basically, right, two screens somehow. Okay, so basically, yeah, if you want to get involved in our, we, we, we are going most likely to run some usability studies in the future. And this is basically the first one is a sign up link. You, when you sign up there, I, hope, I will hope this will be visible in the recording and hopefully the slide will end up somewhere on the conference page. So if you want to get back to this or there is like some short URL and basically we will reach out to the people who are interested in trying out this new interface if they sign up there. And most likely some of you might have already seen some uh, uh, emails on like Fedora Devel where we are we're looking for people wanting to participate in these usability studies. So basically, it's also why I actually, some of the raised points, I, I've, see, I've heard that people, people say that, but just a small subset of that. We already, I think we have really good feedback from you today, so thanks a lot for that already. And this is like the, our mailing list basically, like again, that's good communication channel to reach out to, to the team. Uh, and this is basically like the structured questions we had. So it's clear or, or over time. So I just suggest if you have any more questions, please, please go ahead. And what I'll try to do is do a really quick demo that was not really planned, but I'll do it anyway. So any more questions? Okay.
Pero es Michael Rosa. Ok. Give me screen will it work <coughs> okay so this is this is the this is actually the anaconda web ui live and running on some avs in uh, avs instance and uh, yeah it's very nice that you can do you can do stuff like uh, Should I zoom it or is it too small? You can like, this is really nice for debugging for developers. But I mentioned to, uh, okay, this is really hard to do. But about the, the log viewer, um, so basically what we, can, what we have is, is this. This is like some dump from a, from a log file. But I think you can get, kind of get the idea like we, we can use this element to show any reasonably structured data. And it already does like type to search and stuff like that. So basically what mentioned, uh, what Jerzy uh, Mraček mentioned is, uh, yeah, we have a package installation log somewhere already. So that could be one of the options. You could have like tabs. Or it could be an action that you, when you install the DNF payload, you could have some like, show me more information. You click that and you get this model window with the data about that. There could be the all the messages that fly past when you install could be in a log file and you can see them there to check check everything is fine. Stuff like that. Mm. And yeah, basically very very quickly what we have now. You have seen it already. This is the second screen. Select some disks. You check it, it looks fine. I think we add some more time there to actually show the spinner. Sometimes it was too fast. This is the review screen. And this should show you the, the scary, scary dialogue that we will erase all your, all your data. Because we will. And this is the current current uh, progress screen. It's as MVP as you can get it, basically. But still, you have the, the, the wizard model, you can put more screens there. As, as, as Raja mentioned, it's, uh, scalability is still something we're looking into because there can definitely be dependencies between screens, like some stuff might need network before you can interact with it. If you select a different installation source, then it should drop the package like selection screen if you switch to OS3 or whatever. And again, like if you put a kickstart and then you decide to change the kickstart or something, yeah, the, the, the dependencies is something that was kind of handled in the hub and spoke model, but not very well. In, on rail, you need networking to use the rail CDN, but you have spokes that are next to each other. So how do you know where you need to go to set up your networking? You, you don't. So it was not good user experience already. So can you show the logs? Are they, are they, are they live or? So basically, uh, the logs are live. But the file never gets updated, so unfortunately. <laughs> but they can be, definitely. We, we, I wanted to show the syslog there. There is a syslog file that I think it gets updated live, but I hit some limits on <clears throat> on the file size in the cockpit tooling, so I was not able to to handle that that easily. But uh, cockpit can you can basically run arbitrary binaries using cockpit on the on the target machine. Like the tooling for cockpit is pretty pretty nice. And you can all use this for tests. So basically, you can execute random commands on the mesh, on the virtual machine where the tests are running. So it's the same stuff. It's pretty pretty powerful and really nice to use. So the plan is to basically run some get or whatever on the log instead, and then stream the stuff there. I think that's that's the limitation of what was mentioned on the DNF talk of like how much stuff you can move over the bus because this is running over the bus, of course, from the backend to 
the DUI. We are at the end of the coffee break, so... Yes. <laughs> Perfect. We should release our captive audience. Okay, that, that's all. Uh, I ho thanks for all the feedback, it was really nice, and we will be somewhere if you still want to ask more questions. And sorry for using up your coffee break. I hope you liked it. <laughs> <laughs>